what I'd like to do is to uh, try to what I, try to develop a kind of a schema for appropriating some of the data that uh, has been coming up in Gareth's study. Uh, so this is very schematic, uh, but I think it might be useful to have a schema uh, for thinking about some of that stuff. So this is a paper that uh, I've been working on with uh, Ryan Hickerson, uh, who sadly couldn't come. If we'd known we were going to present it, maybe we would have had him come, uh, called Metal Capacity and the Applied Phenomenology of Judgment. So what I'm going to do, I, I, um, as far as I got through my PowerPoint presentation at 5 this morning, I'm going to go through that. We have a prepared script. I'm happy to share it with people. I'd love to get feedback on it. Uh, and I'm going to read the last few pages of it at the end, because that's where we've got our kind of one case study and the conclusions. And I want to make sure I present what Ryan and I have agreed on as our view. Uh, but let me just talk through some of the setup first, establish the schema, and then I'll read you the bit where we try to apply it. Uh, let's see, there we go. So uh, the Essex Autonomy Project, uh, which is organizing this event, a big, one of our kind of big themes, uh, rubrics for thinking about some of these issues is this phrase, deciding for oneself. Uh, we want to know what it means to make a decision for oneself, a uh, hard problem we're finding. One way in which we uh, thematize that idea is in connection with this idea of autonomous judgment. Um, judgment that somehow uh, betrays autonomy. Maybe all judgment is autonomous. Rousseau, I think, thought that. It wouldn't be judgment if it weren't self-determination. Um, we are kind of leaving that, uh, that open. And then a kind of everyday speech will come to the passage from which this is a quote at the end today. I made the decision on my own in the end. What are the truth conditions, I guess, for that? Or what's, what thought is that, uh, is that expressing? That's the kind of general area we are, we've been thinking in. Uh, of course, we have uh, this, and, and to me, an enormous advantage that we're thinking about this in a particular legal moment in the history of the sort of juridico uh, medical tradition uh, that's framed by the Mental Capacity Act. Gareth talked about that yesterday. I'm not going to talk much about it today. Um, I, just this, we like this quote. Uh, it's not actually from the Act, but it's from the case law that led to the Act. A competent adult has the absolute right to refuse medical treatment for any reason, rational or irrational, or for no reason at all. Uh, it's an interesting combination of a, a right that is both absolute and in a certain way conditional. That sounds like, to a philosopher, that sounds like a contradiction. Either it's conditional or it's absolute. I think you, it's not actually a contradiction. Once you've got the right, you don't have to weigh it against any other interests or anybody else's rights. It doesn't, you know, doesn't get be matched up against state interests or whatever. Once you've got it, you've got it. It absolutely trumps everything else. But whether you have it or not has this condition. That's the competent adult bit. You've got to be capable of making uh, decisions. Um, so that's the kind of legal context in which we're thinking about this. And of course, that makes it a sort of a threshold concept in the law, right? It's a yes or no matter. So the, the kind of broad question one's got to take up here, how do we decide whether someone has the ability to decide? Uh, and I actually think the double occurrence of deciding that is sort of important. You can phenomenologize the decider, or you can actually phenomenologize the assessor as well. Uh, I think it's worth uh, doing both of those things. I've got some on both sides of that equation here, I hope, by the end. A couple of terminological uh, points uh, before getting to the matter at hand. Uh, so first of all, on ph the phenomenology of judgment, what would that be? Uh, so let's talk about those two terms. Judgment, first of all. Judgment, as the logicians among you will know, has this narrow, well-defined use in logic. A judgment's like a proposition. A judgment is a truth of valuable content. Frege says it's the sort of thing about which it makes sense to ask, is it true? Uh, that's a very, very well-defined notion of judgment. And it's distinct, it's, it's what, uh, what we call a content rather than an act. Um, the logicians are really interested in the propositional contents as opposed to the act of judging. So I mark that usage, we acknowledge that usage, but we're not going to use judgment in that logician's well-defined sense. We're going to use it in a very poorly defined, messy sense, where we're more interested on the act side, yeah? the act of judgment, the exercise of judgment. Uh, so that's our interest here. The judgment is a kind of act, uh, it's the exercise of the capacity to judge, and so this bit in italics is, instead of our definition, we just have this phrase, uh, 
judgment is what judges do when they exercise the capacity to judge. Judges here doesn't mean people in courtrooms necessarily. It's anybody who's you know, making judgment calls in the course of their, uh, their lives. What about phenomenology? Another huge contentious term, of course, even more contentious. Um, so we want to use that phrase in a particular sense. One thing we have not done over the course of this conference so far is try to be explicit about what it would mean to take a phenomenological approach in psychiatry. I think Matthew's going to talk about that a little bit later today. I'm interested in thinking uh, about what that would mean. Um, so for now, I just want to be stipulative about how we're using that, Ryan and I, in this particular idiolect of our paper. Um, we do not want to use phenomenology as the name for some specific methodology. That's one way in which the term has been used in the phenomenological tradition. There's some special method that one uses in order to try to get you know, results in this field, whether it's the FOK or whatever it is. We're not using it in that sense. Phenomenology for us is defined by its theoretical aims uh, and the kind of objects or entities with which it's concerned. So for us, we're interested in judgment as an experience of judges. That's what we're trying to get at. And we are absolutely open-minded about what the methods are for that. It might be Husserlian epoche. If that gets us results, we're happy with that. It might be neuroscience. We're happy with that. It might be, you know, in, the, in the paper we use a little bit of social psychology. It might be that. So we're open-minded about what the uh, methods are. Maybe too open-minded. Some of my phenomenological friends are nervous about how much we're letting in under this heading of phenomena. But the basic idea is we want to know what it's like to engage in judgment. Uh, the, I'm going to use judgment and decision here somewhat interchangeably. I recognize there are important distinctions some people draw between them. The important point for our purpose is that in making a decision, one's exercising one's capacity for judgment. Uh, okay, so phenomena like defined more by its aims and objects than by its commitment to any particular method. Uh, second bit of terminology has to do with this phrase, mental capacity. Uh, this is a phrase that has a curious sort of structure and a curious history. I'm not going to go too far into it here, but I just want to mark a couple of points about it. Uh, in the paper, we're using competence and capacity interchangeably here. Uh, the, I think oftentimes those two words are effectively interchangeable. There's a difference, it's one of these potato-potato kind of phenomena, that in the US, legal jurisdictions typically talk about competence whereas the UK legal instruments are talk about capacity, but they occupy the same sort of semantic place in the law. They operate as threshold concepts for the uh, possession of certain rights and responsibilities. So it's that the thing that, it, that we're mainly interested in. There is some usage in the US context whereby people distinguish between capacity and competence, but we think they're actually making a mistake when they do that. So one thing you'll find in the US literature about this is that people will say, uh, again, speaking now in an American uh, legalese, that uh, competence is a legal notion and capacity is the psychiatric notion. Competence is digital on and off, either you've got it or you've not. Capacity is complicated and messy, and it's a matter of degree, um, and so on. I think that the standard way in which we've seen that distinction drawn in the US context is based on the mistake of thinking that you can sharply separate the medical from the juridical. I think that we are in a world right now where those two things are absolutely interpenetrated. And the idea that you can defer to the psychiatrist to describe capacity and leave it to judges to describe competence is just false to our world. In fact, psychiatrists are making these legal uh, judgments themselves, I think, on the ground. So I don't want to have a big fight about that, but I just wanted to mark the, uh, the, the terminological terrain as we're, as we're using it here. OK, um, so how can the phenomenological investigation of judgment inform our understanding of the capacity to make decision, the treatment decisions? I put how in there, because it seems to me there's an open question whether it's possible at all. Some people are very skeptical about phenomenological investigations. What would it mean to take a phenomenological um, approach to this? Uh, so I'm going to take, we have two strategies that we are taking in sort of pursuing that question. 
One is to really kind of draw on results, strategies, themes that have come out of the phenomenological tradition with a capital P, as uh, Dave had Dennett saying last night, uh, Husserl, uh, Heidegger, Levinas, wherever you find it. Uh, we, you know, there's some results there, I think, uh, and we want to take them up and apply them to this particular case. That's one of the things that we're doing in thinking about phenomenological investigation. Uh, and so that, and one of the main sort of thoughts there, and we have a central thought in the paper, uh, well, there's no sentence that actually says this, we probably should revise it, is the thought that judgment takes place in a world. Uh, there I'm trying to use in a world here in a kind of a loosely Heideggerian sense. It's in a context where things manifest themselves as what they are, where there's significant differences that, uh, that show up, and one has a sense of orientation. Certain sorts of things are more worth doing than others. Uh, there's that phenomenon of being in a world, and judgment, the exercise of judgment, the making of decisions, presupposes that in a certain way that's in place. And so uh, part of the thought is, let's focus on that, if we can, find a way to try to spell out what it is to find oneself oriented in a hermeneutic space, that sense of being in a world, so that we can think about the way that's playing out or informing the capacity uh, to make decisions, the capacity to exercise judgment. Um, I'll come back. I'm not going to talk any more really about world, I don't think. There's some particular themes from the phenomenological tradition about uh, worldliness, stru structures in, in the world in this sense uh, that we do want to focus on. Uh, and then the second part of our strategy is to use what we've been calling second person phenomenology, uh, the uh, phenomenology of the other. Now this is a phrase that, that uh, there's sort of ambiguity here, right? Those of you who know the phenomenological tradition will know there's a lot in there about the experience of others, yeah? But usually that means the experience of alterity, right? It's my, what is it for me to have an experience of you as another thing like me? So in Husserl's Cartesian meditations and Levinas and so on, that's a big sort of theme. That is not what I mean, we mean by second person phenomenology. We mean by second person phenomenology trying to give an account or understand or articulate the experiences that other people are having, yeah? So I want to distinguish second person phenomenology in this traditional sense of the experience of alterity, Levinas, Husserl, and so on, from this particular enterprise of trying to get at somehow to articulate the structure of the experiences that other people are having. Traditionally, phenomenology has been kind of a first personal exercise. I try to articulate the structures of my own experience, but it seems to me there's no reason why it shouldn't be this other thing. And in fact, they, there is an established body of experts in this. I think uh, these clinical psychiatrists are just, you know, that's their stock in trade. That's what they do day in, day out. You do, many of you in this room do, is in the context of clinical encounters, in dialogue, in face-to-face -face clinical uh, encounters, are trying to understand and articulate what the experience of other people is like. I, I mean, one thing we haven't got to in this workshop yet is trying to figure out, how is it that you guys do that? That's incredible. What are the tricks of the trade? How do you figure out you know, the truth from the fictions um, in, in all that? We talked about that a little bit last night in connection with Dennett, but I think there's a lot of work in trying to make explicit what it is that psychiatrists know implicitly and exercise in their practice. Anyway, that's what I mean by second person um, phenomenology. All right, so now I want to talk about the Mac Cat T. Uh, I'm going to talk a little, so I realize some of you will know a lot more about this even than, than we do. Um, some of this will be new to some of you. So let me just try to hit the kind of middle ground in terms of specificity. Um, so uh, Grisso and Applebaum, two uh, Americans, uh, one kind of with a background in psychiatry, one in law, I guess, uh, developed this thing, the Mac Cat T. It stands for the MacArthur Competence Assessment Test for Treatment. Uh, and you can see here how they are describing it, a clinical tool to assess patients' capacities, capacities to make treatment decisions. The plural there actually turns out to be quite important um, in the way they think about their instrument. Uh, developed by Grisson Applebaum in the 90s, uh, it was rooted uh, in this study of uh, judicial precedent. So again, uh, competence is meant to be, is this legal standard. The courts have had this long history of adjudicating who's competent and who's not. So Chris, let's study that and we'll draw out of that what the standard has been that's been at work in these adjudications. 
and then we'll try to devise an instrument that sort of captures that. And so that's been the output of that study is a clinical instrument for use in clinical settings where patient capacity is to be, uh, is to be assessed. Uh, the MACCAPT is organized around a structured or semi-structured interview. One thing I still haven't got a straight answer on is what's the difference between a structured and a semi-structured interview. This is not just a tick box kind of exercise. Um, it is an interview, and it's an interview that is tailored to the particular patient and their treatment decision. Yeah. So uh, you need it's, it, it, you devise the interview the particular interview strategy based on information about uh, the the circumstance, the decision situation that the patient is facing. And then it scores patients in four areas of capacity. Uh, Gareth gave us these uh, yesterday. It's not quite the same list as the Mental Capacity Act list. There's interesting work, I think, to be done in trying to compare them. Uh, but it's more or less the same. Understanding, appreciation, reasoning, and expressing the <coughs> choice. Um, so let's just play that out a little bit. What do they mean by that? Understanding, I've not reproduced their full gloss on all this, but here's the basic idea. Understanding means understanding treatment-related information, what the diagnosis is, what the proposed treatment is. Appreciation is different from that. It's one thing to understand in the abstract that this is, you know, medication for diabetes or whatever, but one's got to also then measure the appreciation of how it applies to my situation. What kind of difference is this going to make in my, uh, in my life? Reasoning, we talked about that a fair bit yesterday, uh, comparing alternatives in light of risk and benefits. That's not meant to be a definition exactly of reasoning, but reasoning incorporates that. And I actually think we'll get to this in a little bit, that they tend to privilege that conception of what reasoning is, kind of cost-benefit analysis. And then finally, expressing uh, choice. So how do you do all that? How do you uh, assess people in these four areas of capacities? Well, there are these four verbs that always come up in the T: disclose and paraphrase, inquire and probe. Disclose and paraphrase means, look, I first disclose to you what I know about your treatment situation. Uh, this is what the doctors think is wrong with you. These are the uh, treatment options that are being, you, you, you uh, are on the table here for discussion. Uh, now, can you explain to me what I just explained to you in your own, use your own words and uh, and paraphrase what I've just said to you. That's the core of the interview. You go through various stages with that. First as regards to the diagnosis, then with regard to treatment options, risks and benefits, um, and so on. So that's the disclose and paraphrase. But inquire and probe is an important part of it. And in a way, how much is built into inquire and probe turns out to be a really important question um, for, for us. Uh, we don't, I mean, I should say at the beginning, we're not against the maquette tea. I'm going to say some critical things about it. I think that it's in certain ways dangerous, like any instrument um, is probably dangerous. But I think there's, uh, everything turns on how well it's used, how it's used. And so part of what we're trying to, um, to do is to think about how to use it well. Uh, and then the key thing here, this uh, is something that maybe people will want to quarrel about. Let's, we should talk about it. Uh, just flag it as something potentially controversial in the way we've been putting this. The focus on the whole is what we call individual cognitive performance on skills involved in making decisions. I'm not going to try to define cognitive, uh, but you've seen an illustration of the kinds of things. To follow a moderately complex medical description of a condition, for instance, uh, to weigh up uh, risks and, and benefits. So that's what in the paper we call individual cognitive performance criteria. Okay, what's so important about it? Well, it's novel compared to other instruments. Uh, one of the things that's a distinctive novelty of the Maquette T relative to the, the things that were basically on the table when Grisso and Applebaum got to work is that it's decision specific. There were uh, their earlier Grisso Applebaum instruments uh, involved decision vignettes. Yeah, so we, we describe to you, uh, we want to assess your capacity, but we describe some generic uh, decision situation and then we ask you a series of questions about it. It's not about your situation, and for that reason, it doesn't line up well with the legal standards. Those are the ones that were kind of standardly on the table, including Brissot and Applebaum's original um, model. The MACCAT T is about your decision. It's customized, tailored to, to you. Uh, so that's a big advantage in bringing it closer to the legal standard. And Grisso and Applebaum are very clear about what counts as winning in, in, in one of these instruments would be matching whatever the judges would rule in your jurisdiction. That would be a correct 
uh, a correct result uh, in, in an instrument uh, if, you, if it would do that. And then it's efficient. It only takes 15 or 20 minutes. It's one of the dangerous things about it, of course. Uh, it doesn't take you know, a series of 90-minute interviews but in a pretty quick interview, uh, and a lot of it has been run in lots of trials you know, by students and so on without uh, particular clinical experience. So uh, that's an advantage uh, for, certain, for certain purposes. And then I think it's fair to say it's had an enormous impact. I mean, here I've quoted Applebaum saying it, but I think he's probably right. He says it's the most widely used psychometric instrument in the assessment of capacity for treatment decisions. Braden and Volman uh, call it a gold standard in clinical psychiatry. Uh, I'm not sure how broadly that would be, shared times would be by gold standard, but it is viewed as a, uh, an important tool. And then there are a lot of studies, Gareth has been involved in some of these in the team at the Maudsley. It sustains high inter-rater reliability, uh, it gets, you get correlations with items in BPRS and so on. There are various ways in which its robustness has been, uh, has been tested. Okay, very important now uh, to be clear about what the MACAT does not do, is not designed to do. It does not yield an up or down judgment as to a patient's capacity. That's part of the plural there in the title, capacities. So it's, it's a funny thing with, with Grisso and Applebaum. You, you run the instrument and you're gonna get numerical scores for these four things, but damn it, you are not meant to add them together, right? That is not, that, that would be a mis, you're very clear, that would be a misuse of our test to give a sum of these, of these scores. Because part of what they're saying is, look, all of these different capacities are in play, and it's not one thing. The instrument does not measure the overall competence of the patient. Um, it just measures them in these particular capacities. Um, so you don't get a single numerical score. There's no cutoff score. It doesn't yield pass or fail results. So in a certain sort of way, that, that first T in Matt Cat is a misnomer. It's not really a test. Like a pregnancy test is a test, it like gives you an answer one way or another. Because uh, it, it, it just doesn't, they don't want it to do that. Um, and in particular, they're adamant that it should not replace clinical judgment. I think I've got, yeah, here's a quote, a characteristic quote from them. It's a misuse of the MACAT T to make judgments about the patient's competence to consent to treatment simply on the basis of their MACAT T scores. Um, now, look, it's, they say that. Um, I think there's a sort of separate story to tell here about the way in which instruments take on a life of their own. There's another bit of phenomenology about that. Um, and they do acknowledge in some of their recent papers in replying to critics um, that, they, that a lot of people have not noticed their warnings about misuse. And you might actually think that's kind of inevitable, right? If you make a 15-minute administrable test, there's a certain sort of predictable thing that is going to happen. Um, and talking to some clinicians about this um, in medical context is, oh, this is kind of, there's a general pattern with medical instruments generally. They get designed for one purpose, they serve that pretty well, and they're there, their people understand how to use them, and so there's a kind of instrument creep phenomenon that I think is actually quite important to understand. Uh, one thing I, we would like to know more about is the way in which it's actually um, being used. Uh, if anybody has information about that, uh, you can secretly report it to me and I won't use your name. The, uh... <coughs> All right, good. Uh, so that's the MACAT T. Uh, so what uh, lessons then might we draw from the phenomenological uh, tradition? So I've already sort of said the main point here that I want a judgment takes place in a world that is in a context where things show up or are available for interpretation, where some, some options show themselves to be significantly different from others and so on. And then you could go on to make a bunch of negative claims that a world is not just a collection of objects or entities or people or so on. It's the context in which those things uh, manifest themselves. Uh, so how can we make use of that? For the purposes of this discussion, I want to focus on three things that I think are part of that world structure. That the it's part of the fruit of the phenomenological tradition, in a way, is it's taught us certain elements about world structure. And the three we want to focus on, I'll just run through them fairly quickly, and then talk through one application: time, others, and uh, identity. So, uh, look, okay, time. How does time show up in the MacCat T? How does it work there? Um, well, one thing to say is that capacity is assessed at a time. Uh, it was a point that somebody was making at the end of the day yesterday. Um, I think Quentin was. Look, it's a, it's, you know, I assess you now. I get the, a rating of your capacity at whatever that moment is that we run the, 
uh, we run the test. Crystal and Apple have some advice about which time to pick. In the Metal Capacity Act, you have this phrase, at the material time, the time that matters. For the city. <coughs> That's when we're interested in your capacity. Uh, it's not your standing state we're interested in. We want to know when you signed that consent form, uh, did you have capacity at that time? So there is a kind of a, it's a time slice. It's not a durationless instant, but it is a, uh, a, particular, a particular datable uh, time that, that both the uh, MACCAT and the NCA are concerned with. And then we've been using this notion of future subjunctive temporality. I don't know if that's a helpful way of putting it. The, um, in the assessment of reading. So here's one of the questions that's in the script, um, or it's a suggested question in the script. What do you, sorry, that's a typo. What do you believe will happen if you are not treated? Uh, so I'm trying to tease out your, uh, uh, your use and way kind of ability. So he asks you questions like that. But what's the thing, you know, just notice the distinctive sort of tense there. It's a question about uh, the future but it's a future under a certain assumption. That's what we mean by sub future subjunctive uh, uh, information. Uh, so your ability to kind of navigate these future subjunctive temporality is a key part of what's being tested in the MACCAT-T. And you know, that maps very precisely onto traditional models of what decision rationality consists in, right? You think about you know, classical decision theoretic models, you start out with some preferences, and then you've got to think about you know, what, the, what are the possible outcomes under present actions, and then how do they map onto my preference scales. So that's all, that's can canonical classical models of decision theory or rationality uh, all operate with implicitly or explicitly with this future subjunctive temporality. So we introduce this notion of future subjunctive reasoning. That's uh, the reasoning of risk assessment and cost-benefit analysis, among other things. All right, well, so you now what I just want to do is I just want to contrast. Look, that was time in the MACAT T, material time and future subjunctive temporality. What are the temporal structures in worldly decision making? Well, this is a big, big topic, but here are a couple of little tiny clues and shards. Uh, so here's one clue. Uh, the, uh, in the paper, we don't cite Garrett's data, but it's certainly something we've been noticing in the interviews we've been a part of uh, at the Maudsley. Patients who are asked to explain their decisions often talk about the past before they talk about the future. Uh, you know, it's one thing to, if you subject somebody to the MACCAT T, you're asking for a certain series of questions. But if you just ask people, how did you decide to participate in this research interview, very often the thing that shows up first is some statement about the past. It's about something they did, or in the treatment decisions as well, a story about an earlier medical procedure. A couple of the cases that we were involved in, it's a story about my father did something. Um, now from a kind of, you know, your future subjunctive temporality, that's sort of, there's no direct relevance of that to the kind of classical model of what decision making. It's at most ancillary information. You want to, you'd have to translate it somehow into cost-benefit analysis for it to really show up as part of decision rationality. But it's there in the, in the phenomenon. So the observation that we make about this, I think there's a lot more to say. This is, again, very schematic. Decision making requires orientation in the present. Orientation is one of those in the world phenomena. To be in the world is to have to, to know which way is up, um, and what's better and what's worse along various different grades. Decision making requires orientation in the present, and this orientation is as much a function of the ways in which one meaningfully appropriates events from one's past as it is about calculations over possible futures. Just the tip of the iceberg, I think, there. OK, look, OK, we said time, others, identity. Here's others. How do others show up in the MACAT T? I got to tell you, this slide, this is like 6 o'clock this morning. It's a little bit unfair, OK? But here's a characteristic way in which others show up in the literature around the, uh, around the MACAT T. So this is Applebaum in a recent piece in the New England Journal of Medicine. He says, uh, quote, when fear or anxiety appears to be interfering with a patient's ability to attend to and process information, introducing a known and trusted confidant or advisor to the consent process may permit the patient to make competent judgment. Now notice the crucial thing for me is this is in the section of consequences of a finding of incompetence. It's only after you've decide, decided that the guy is incompetent that now we start to mention the role that other people might play in the story, right? I think there's something problematic about that. Again, they have more to say than just that. It's unfair, but it is in a certain way characteristic of one way of thinking about the, about the test. All right, there's others in the MACET T. What's others in worldly decision making? This is kind of a long uh, thing, so let, let me just read it. 
so here's one sort of example of the role of others in worldly decision making. An Alzheimer's patient has cognitive deficiencies and, and they increasingly compromise the ability to communicate. He can't finish his sentences, he can't remember how to write letters, and so on. When we consider his individual cognitive performance, significant deficits come to light. But he's lucky, he finds himself embedded in a community of family members and carers who have quite an intimate understanding of his situation, his preferences, his concerns, and so on. Now it's very important, these others do not make decisions on his behalf. And a lot of the time he's making decisions that they wish he would not make. They're not substitute decision makers. But they are able to help him complete his sentences. Although the patient himself may not recall the words he wants, he can clearly recognize and indicate when other people express his thoughts correctly, and even more so when they get it wrong. So faced with a treatment decision, this patient relies on his community of intimates. It's in virtue of their communicative partnership that he's able to discuss and assess his treatment options with clinical staff, understand and weigh the options, and communicate his own decisions. So look, I think this, I'm not saying Brissot and Applebaum cannot recognize this. I think the Maquette team, when it's well run, can recognize this sort of phenomenon. And I just want to point to this as a kind of example of worldly others, others as they play a role in worldly decision making. Uh, there's another case uh, that's come up that, that uh, maybe Gareth can, we can impose on Gareth to talk about a little bit, uh, about a certain, uh, an individual in frontal lobe uh, case uh, who experiences moods of uh, in sort of intense <coughs> emotional volatility. Uh, but he's in a community of others who help him manage those episodes, not by taking the decisions for him, but working together through them. Uh, yeah, okay, so here's a, an attempt to kind of capture a kind of st a structure of that case. Uh, a more mundane example, and I think maybe that's one that's a little harder to, to capture uh, in Grisso and Applebaum's instrument. S is prone to moods in which he's liable to make rash decisions that he'll subsequently regret. T, his partner, somebody in his, what we're calling decision community, T knows this fact about S and is sufficiently intimate with S to be able to recognize these moods coming on in S and is often able to moderate the mood so as to preclude rash decisions. Importantly, S knows all this about himself and looks to T to moderate his decision making under those circumstances. And again, S does not always make decisions of which T approves, so it's not substitute decision making. So I think that's real world, uh, worldly uh, others. So we've been trying to articulate that in terms of this notion of decision communities. Uh, I think there are decision communities all over the place. Science is a big decision community, but the psychiatric encounter in the clinic is a decision community. Families are decision communities. Um, they're all over the place, and they're very, very important phenomena. So, and the point here, what we want to say, even our individual decisions characteristically take place from a position within community, a community of individuals. We don't want to fight about whether there are some solitary cases. I don't know, Robinson Crusoe made some, we don't care. Uh, but the ones that in, our, in real life, um, the uh, decisions characteristically take that form. And then we want to draw this distinction, kind of this is a typology of decision communities <coughs> that I think is quite important. So there's one case we call solitary decision. That's the Robinson Crusoe. All by myself and with no reference, I decide maybe there are such cases, maybe there are none, doesn't matter. But we can at least mark that as a place in the typography. Then there's collective decision making. That's the we decided case, right? So we as an electorate chose the, you know, we decided as a family where to go on vacation. A lot of, you know, there's a lot of problems, of course, associated with that. But it's a genuine phenomenon. We've been uh, following uh, with Keith, is Keith here? Uh, yeah, Andrea Westland's uh, treatment of, of, of this. Uh, but the case that we're really interested in is the third case. That's the form of decision community where it's proper to say I decided, but nonetheless others played an essential role in my being able to do so. So that's first person singular judgment, but it's essentially embedded in these communities. We think most decision is like that. And in fact, we need another topography underneath that to think about what those essential roles are, but I don't have that to offer. And so then we want this notion of distributed capacity. Uh, I think this is quite important. Um, I hope you'll let me have it. An individual may have the capacity to make decisions, but that capacity is itself distributed across his decision community. So you think about the case with some, a simple example of that is the completing the sentences phenomenon. Together, they have the capacity to, make a, to, to express a choice, but the capacity itself is not possessed by either one of them alone. It's a distributed 
It's a distributed capacitor. And so now we can come to some corollaries. Um, uh, let, we've got to think carefully about whether we can have these or not. But here, let me try them, and you tell me if I have to take them back. An individual's decision-making capacity can vary while measurement against individual cognitive performance criteria remains constant. So if you take the guy who has the intimate, who helps him complete the sentences, and you just measure his individual cognitive performance criteria, those can remain the same, but if the partner is now lost or leaves him or dies, his capacity changes. The individual uh, measurements, the individual cognitive capacities remain the same, the capacity can collapse, right? Um, and so, if that's true, if you let me have that, then you ought to also say any test for capacity that confines its attention to individual cognitive performance criteria will miss significant variation in capacity. All right, very briefly about identity. Uh, it's something that we've had some interesting discussions here over the past few days, and I, one of the things I've learned is I've got a lot more to learn. Uh, the uh, so identity, one manifestation of the phenomenon we're concerned with, again, to philosophers, we're not interested in numerical identity over time, that kind of metaphysical notion that's in Locke and so on, um, but rather more like the psychological notion of being possessed of an identity. Uh, so one thing we notice uh, that, uh, in Garrett's interviews, why did you decide to do X? The answer to that is a kind of an identity statement. <laughs> Um, a statement about identity. I'm a curious person. I'm a father. I'm a first responder. That's a, fi a form of answer to that. And then there's a limiting case. Here I have, without permission from Garrett, quoted one line. I love this line from one of the interviews. That's the kind of bloke I am. Uh, now, in a certain way, that could sound like a no explanation at all, right? I want to know why you did that. You say, that's I'm the kind, that kind of bloke. It sounds vacuous. But I think in experience, it's not vacuous. I think that's the marker of a real structure in experience. Um, and so, uh, again, I mark this as a kind of phenomenological talent, a tangent. Think about the temporality, the tense of those sentences. In one way, they're simple present tense sentences. But what's the temporality of being possessed of, a, uh, of, a, of an identity in that way, of being able to say, that's the kind of bloke I am? I don't know the answer to that question, but I'm pretty sure it's fairly complicated. Uh, so, uh, look, I don't have too much to say about this. I just got two little shards again. Um, element, we call this elements of the phenomenology of identity, two points we're using. First, this is where we, our ecumenicalism is showing. Uh, the, uh, so this is Self and Society, the Hewitt uh, text now, I guess we're quoting seventh edition. What does he say about it? Identity is a sense of self built up over time as the person embarks on and pursues projects or goals that are not thought of as those of a community, but as the property of the person. I think there's a lot packed into that. This idea, a certain kind of sense of self, this connects up, I think, with some of the things Stefan was talking about yesterday. There's a sense of self. Exactly what that means, I think, is tremendously hard to say. It's not a sensation in any, in any straightforward sense. It, it's extended, built up, he says, over time. It's extended over, it occupies time in a certain way. And then this thing at the end, projects or goals that are experienced as the property of the person. We, I don't like the way Hewitt says they're thought of in that way. That doesn't seem the right way of capturing it. But they're experienced as, as my own. Um, so to be possessed of an identity involves a capacity to own one's projects and, uh, and goals. Second element of the phenomenology of identity. Um, what is it to have an identity? Um, identities pre-delineate decision situations. I think that's part of what it is to have an identity. So here's the way we've been putting it. Possession of an identity pre-delineates our experience in circumstances in which judgment is exercised in making decisions, providing a sense of orientation already in place prior to undertaking particular deliberations. So our example is a first responder comes on the scene, there's an accident, there's a person in distress. To, to, be, to have your identity to be a first responder, you're not going to ask your, whether it's you know, worth risking you know, your safety, compromising your safety to help this person. That's already settled. To have that identity is to encounter the decision situation in a way where there's just no need to deliberate about that. It's already kind of a given. And then there's scope for more for specific kinds of deliberations, technical issues, and so on, of course. How much risk to take, um, whether this is the, the best risk to do, and so on. Um, all right. Now, I've already been talking for 45 minutes, have I? Just about. Just about. Um, so let me, I'm not, I said I was going to read the last bit of the paper, but I think I shan't.
Let me just mention these two cases very schematically um, to think a little bit about how they would apply. So the idea is if you were to, uh, part of the thought, if you were to take a phenomenological approach, one of the things you would do is you would draw this fruit, the harvest from the phenomenological tradition. You'd notice that judgment takes place in a world. You'd notice that worldly judgment has at least these three elements, this distinctive temporality, the uh, a distinctive way of uh, others are implicated, and this uh, notion of being possessed of an identity. Um, and so you would be then try to, uh, you know, try to deal with particular difficult cases by drawing on those sorts of elements. And so two kinds of cases we can want to illustrate. Um, one is the case of Mrs. A. This is a court of protection case that came out last year. Um, very interesting in that case is the case where the local authority is arguing that uh, Mrs. A lacks the capacity to make a decision about whether to use contraception. Um, she's been pregnant a couple of times. The child has been taken away, the children have been taken away from her at birth because she's found not to have the capacity to care for them. It's a tremendous trauma, and the local authority says, we've got to find a way out of this cycle. Um, and so they're, they're petitioning the court for forcible contraception. You can see the headlines in the Telegraph, right? Uh, the, uh, so what the judge finds in that case, in a certain way, we, we argue in the piece, if you look at the, the, the transcript from the court proceedings, Mrs. A could pass the MACCAT T. She's actually in the bottom 1% of uh, IQ. Um, but she can pass, the, the court found at least, she could pass these cognitive tests. She understands what contraception is and so on. But the judge found that she nonetheless lacked capacity because of the role that Mr. A was playing in her situation. That her decision community was one that was disrupting her capacity. And it's only because when you get that bit of Mrs. A's situation into view, the structure of the, the dysfunctional decision community, that you can come to a real you know, informed decision about her, her capacity. So that's a, one case where we think this phenomenological approach is salubriously at work. In the, but I think you would miss it on a certain kind of use of the MACAT T. The second case we talk about this is the case that Gareth has been involved in. Again, we're, for now in this paper, uh, we're just relying on things that are in the public domain. This was a BBC uh, radio uh, Inside the Ethics Committee episode that talked about the case of John. Uh, John's in prison on remand. Uh, he has schizophrenia. Um, he's uh, under a mental health uh, order uh, for involuntary treatment of his mental disorder. But he also has throat cancer. Uh, and he refused, he, at first, when his uh, throat cancer was explained to him, uh, the, the, the indicated procedure is surgical removal of the voice box. It's a you know, life-altering surgery. And uh, at first, he consents to it. The, the surgeon takes his consent. But then a few days later, he changes his mind. Even to say that might be too much. He, he, then at that point, he says it's, a, it's, a, um, it's all a conspiracy. It's, uh, they're trying to kill him and so on. And he refuses to give his consent. So in that kind of case, you have a dilemma where there are two different times, right? If you, depending on which time you pick, the capacity assessment um, comes out quite differently. Um, and what we argue about that case there are two kinds of points we want to make about that case. First, it's very important, this is kind of a Husserl lesson. Don't, you're, you're not, you don't want to assess the facades of John. You want to assess John. John is the thing that is showing itself in both of these episodes, and you've got to find a way of, of, of assessing that. Uh, and if you just assess at a time, the capacities at a time, you're going to miss that. Um, but also a crucial thing about John's case, I'm sorry to rush through this, is the structure of his decision community. He has a decision community, a bit, quite an elaborate one. You've got family members, you've got psychiatrists, you've got surgeons, and so on. Uh, the, a, a lot of people involved in it. And one of the things that they do is they try to make sure that his decision is in a certain way in touch with the reality that it's, uh, it's concerned with. Uh, make sure he understands this. And I think that's part of what it has to, you know, in order to recognize some mental act as an exercise of judgment, you've got to be able to see that it's engaged with the relevant evidence. This is part of the point that Comarine, I think, was making yesterday. Use of evidence is, in a certain way, always good use. Um, and what the decision community was doing there, uh, we argue, is ensuring that there was that kind of grip 
on the reality that the decision was concerned with. But again, that's something that only comes into view when you take a view that's broader than mere individual cognitive performance uh, criteria. You gotta look at the structure of the decision community uh, and, and, and what it's doing uh, in order to support capacity. Okay, let me stop at that. Thanks, Will.